Okay, tonight I uh, want to move forward now to, uh, we usually take a break, but actually I think we're going to just press if everybody's good pressing. Uh, what we wanted to do, like I kind of alluded to, is we want to talk about astrophotography, but not actually the how to do it, to do things. We want to talk about perspectives, right? Uh, how did you find your way into this hobby? What stuff did you buy? You, you know, you made a lot of decisions along the way. You probably struggled. How did you get to where you are now? Um, Mitch, Chris, and uh, Juan do terrific things with their particular road uh, roadmap, and we want to hear that perspective. Um, so that's what you're going to hear tonight. Um, this, by the way, is my favorite astral image. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that because, one, I took it, okay? <laughs> I did take it at an astral observing event, and it's an in cell phone image, right? So it's an astral image in my mind. Okay. That's my thing. <laughs> but uh, what processing uh, software did you use? Whatever, <laughs> Tim, whatever Tim Cook built into his, uh, his phone. Maybe a little bit of guiding here. Uh, <laughs> there's probably one a little guiding here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is a cool view. I think this is the last day. The sun hit the Uric HSP just perfectly. Beautiful uh, site. Uh, I love it. So, there you go. That's my Um So I'm going to. Bear with me, I'm going to take a little bit of a, I'm going to build some analogies here, right? Try to set this up. Uh, I'll probably take it too far, but hey, <laughs> just live with it, all right? <laughs> so astrophotography, it's it's super cool. We we Probably all of us have thought about it. If not, we're, we're doing it. Um, it's cool. It's definitely challenging. I can definitely speak for that myself. Um, but it's also very rewarding. When you get that image that you're proud of, doesn't have to be like Hubble. When you're proud of it and you know what it took to get it, it's like really rewarding stuff. So I kind of liken that to this road, you know, beautiful vistas, kind of a smooth, windy road. There's really no hazards you're seeing here. Um, this is the road we want to be on, right? If we want our equipment to work, we want to get to that skill level where we can acquire the target, we can take the image, and we can process it to produce that result. That's that's kind of that's kind of the road I, I want to be on, right? I see somebody who looks like they went off for a little bit. <laughs> Ignore that for now. That's that's where we want to be. What I think sometimes we see is this kind of a road. <laughs> um, I've been on this road. I'm still kind of on this road, um, where you you may start and you may quickly get it in over your head, right? You buy the wrong stuff. You buy this great fancy telescope and all the software and you know terrific mount. And you get in over your head and you say, well, you know, that didn't work. Let me buy something else. You kind of reverse course, right? You buy something else. So you're going up a windy road. There's lots of switchbacks. There's danger at every corner. You know, this might not work. Um, and so, and the Vista it looks dangerous up ahead too, because you know, there's always something else out there that somebody else is doing even better when you're trying to reach that. So that's my analogy. These guys, Mitch, Chris, and Juan, have been on probably all both of these roads. Um, they definitely experienced the one on the left there, uh, the smooth sailing road. And I want them to help <laughs> their lab right now. But uh, they're going to tell you how they basically moved from one road to another and what experiences brought them to where they are now and kind of the lessons learned that they took away. Hopefully, you guys can apply that if you decide to get involved. So. Um, we call it three perspectives, um, three different people. They all came at it differently. Um, they're all successful. That's what they share in common. Mitch, relatively new to the hobby, to astrophotography, but he's got a lot of photography experience in general. So he brought that to the table. Um, he certainly demonstrated success with what I would call an entry level setup. We have some show and tell here. I know the folks online can't see. Uh, but after the meeting, we can talk about the setups. Um, I'd say it's relatively entry level. Uh, it's not a cell phone, so there is some sophistication, but it's definitely manageable by somebody wanting to try to get into this hobby. Uh, Chris, on the other hand, um, his rigs are very capable, but he came at it with a budget in mind, um, and that was kind of the thrust that brought him to where he is today. Also very successful at, at, at uh, imaging, all sorts of things. He also maximized, I think, 
the resources that the club brings to the table. He's used the loaner scope program. He's been on listserv. He's been in the imaging groups. He's talked to folks, you know, here in the audience. Uh, he's really put to use what Novak can offer to fast track his, his way to the smooth sailing road. Right? Uh, and then Juan, who's online, um, he started out when film was, was state of the art. And uh, <laughs> I actually did that as well, believe it or not. That was the only thing we had available. So Juan has the most experience. So by definition, he's made the most mistakes. <laughs> And Juan, I don't mean that as a bad thing because I think he admitted that as well. But he's been in and out of the hobby with various equipment over various spans of time. And uh, he's now one, I, I think, one of our best imagers in the club. And you'll see it here from Juan as well. So that's kind of the setup. My last slide is um, we're not going to teach you how to do any of these things, right? As for photography, a lot of different things, all of which sort of overlap. Um, not entirely. Um, you're not going to walk away knowing how to do those things, but hopefully you'll learn from people that do what what has worked, what didn't work, what they might do differently, and uh, you know what decisions they made along that. Way. So um, that's it for me. Is there any questions here in the room? First of all, about Novak News or where we're going tonight with it. Um, and how about online? Any questions? And if not, I want to invite Mitch up here, and you can start with your slides here. And if you just uh, click the arrow right your left again, awesome, cool. And then should I stand here? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So hi, my name is Mitch Stoker. Um, I'm new to Novak-ish. I joined in December of last year. Uh, I brought a dog, eight-inch Dobsonian, out. Uh, this guy met him. It's just a you know try to learn a nice guy. Um, and uh, before that, uh, I've always been really in love with photography. Uh, so for the past 20 years, I've had digital cameras. Um, some of you guys might groan, but I've never actually really dealt with film. Um, so uh, anyways, um, I'm here tonight basically to talk about how I've recently gotten started in astrophotography. And uh, I know the folks online can't see it, but the first mount that I started off with is, is a iOpcom Skyguider Pro, which is a very basic star tracker that you polar align and it rotates uh, with the Earth. There's some pros and cons to having that, but I found that if you're getting started, it's a really, really affordable option to sort of dip your toes into the field and uh, you know go to all the places where all these other imagers are and look at all the really nice scopes and get gear envy. Uh, which I eventually did get, and uh, I did end up buying uh, a more fully automated rig that um, I not bring because that weighs about 50 pounds, and uh, bringing it up here is going to be a bit of a chore today. So uh, I brought the very lightweight Ioptron Skyguider Pro. Um, so currently, uh, I'll move to the next level. Oh, there we go. So right now, uh, I'm new to the hobby, um, and so I'm still getting used to what sort of targets I should go for and figuring out what really is the extent of uh, the capabilities of the equipment that I have. And so because I'm new, I decided I don't want to go super deep. I want to do mostly wide field, not only because it's a little harder to miss your target, which I'm prone to do, uh, but Wide field is also a lot more forgiving. And so that's why I went with it. Um, so one, my steps currently uh, this year has been more about getting the equipment set up, trying to get good data consistently from it. And my goal next year is to move towards uh, being able to be a better processor uh, of that data that I'm collecting. Um, the one nice thing about astrophotography is you can keep your digital data for forever as long as you have the hard drive space, uh, which is something that I work in uh, television, so I'm used to having lots of big hard drives to store stuff on. But even with some of the projects I've recently worked on with multi night exposures, it's been a little more challenging than I even thought it was going to be. Um, and since I'm so new, one of the nice things is I haven't shot just about anything. So 
most of the time, if I see there's going to be a nice, clear string of beautiful nights, which is later this week, I pull up Stellarium and say, what's in front of me and what sounds interesting to me? So case in point, I shot the Dark Sky or the Dark Shark Nebula the other night from a Bortle 7, uh, mm -hmm. which I would not recommend. Uh, but it was one of those projects where I was like, hey, I'm new. I'm more than happy to go out and run into a wall and make a mistake, but still learn something from it. And, you know, for Portal 7, first time shooting the Dark Nebula, I was really happy with the results. Um, but, like I said, I'm new. I'm more than happy to jump on any type of project that I'm interested in. And that's sort of what I love about it. And I know I can go in the future, come back to that same data, into those same projects, improve upon them as I get better um, and get more data as well. So currently, I have two rigs that I like to image on. Uh, most of the time, I'm shooting at my home in Reston, Virginia. Uh, if it's around the weekends, I do like to go out to Sky Meadows State Park. I do a lot of volunteering, so it's nice that we have after hours access there. Um, and two rigs that I have. First one is, once again, the iOffcom Skyguider Pro. I have a Canon 5D Mark II, which is a full frame, older Canon DSLR, and I shoot with a 100 millimeter lens so it's a very very wide field view and my more automated pro setup uh is a eq6r pro which is a really really big heavy mount so i love it and i shoot with the william optics red cap 51 an asi air uh 183 nc pro and it has auto focusing it's run through an asi air um and one of the interesting things is when I was building out the EQ6R Pro mount, originally the idea was for the telescope setup to actually run off of the IOPCOM SkyGuarder Pro. And it actually still can run off the IOPCOM SkyGuarder Pro. So one of the things that I really look for in my rigs is the ability to slowly build over time as I get better with the equipment that I already have and to leave and to get equipment I know I can grow and upgrade and expand its capability later. Um, so if you're just getting started, one of the things I really recommend doing is find that mount that gets you just enough what you need, but doesn't break your bank, but that you clearly have an ability to grow into. Um, because you'll jump into it and you're going to find it one way or the other. You're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. There's some people in between, but uh, when I started off, I had a group of photography friends who there was about five of us. And out of the five of us, I'm the only one that's actually doing any astrophotography at this point. Um, most of the other guys, they got frustrated with it. And uh, since I've been working with my rig so much, a couple of them actually reached out and we're actually, over the next year, going to try to get some more people converted into the money bit, which is astrophotography. <laughs> so some people like their cars. I like my camera gear. Um, so once again, uh, the IOPCOM Skyguider Pro, which I feel like I'm an IOPCOM salesperson right now saying, this is the mount you want, but seriously, if you have just a DSLR and you really want to try some deep space astrophotography, especially if you're going for wide fields such as Andromeda, the Pleiades, Orion, um, you know, Cyg the Cygnus region, um, it's a very, very light set up in fact when i brought in the rig that's in here today i literally besides the tripod it all fit in a standard camera bag backpack so it's not heavy um it's portable you can take it anywhere in fact when i first got started with the hockey i used to drag it out to skyline drive um i quickly realized that was too high up on the mountain kept getting what i call blown off the mountain because it was too windy um but you know it's not a major investment. You know, if you have a small apartment like I did, you know, you can fit all your gear inside of it. And if you have roommates or, you know, if you're married and have a wife and a kid, you can hide it in the closet without them getting angry with you or having to take up a whole bunch of space. Um, so uh, if you are getting started though, I would definitely, you can look at my big rig with the EQ6R and the Red Cat. But I really, really wouldn't recommend immediately jumping into something as big and heavy and as expensive as that. So you really know that you're going to be into it. Um, the reason I 
sort of made that leap pretty early on because I've been doing this, I've been doing photography for almost 20 years. And once I figured out that I could get good results and I loved it, I was just going to go for it. And so I did. Um, so uh, with the DSLR and a iOptron Stag Editor Pro, um, I have a couple images that I've taken throughout the first year here. Um, all of these images uh, have been taken from Sky Meadow State Park. And this is sort of a quick example of some of the results with just your standard stock, non modified DSLR with a mediocre lens. Uh, what you can expect to get, especially if you travel out to a dark sky site. And if you really want to as well, there's light pollution filters like the Octolong L Pro. So if you live in a light polluted area, that might be an option for you to shoot some broadband targets and to really get some good data that you know you can get your feet wet without having to break the bank and potentially buy a whole lot of gear that you don't want. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, that's sort of what you can expect from a DSLR on the iOS from Skyguider Pro. Um, and then with my big rig, which is a EQ6R Pro, a Red Cap 51, and an ASI. Pro. These are sort of the uh, results that you can expect to get. Um, what I like to do when I go out into the field, especially if I'm traveling to Sky Meadows, is there's only so many days that I can go out to Sky Meadows to get data. So I'm trying to get as much data on whatever targets I want as possible. So that's why I ended up eventually getting two full different rigs to trying to focus on just one. Um, just because if I'm going to take the time and invest go out to a dark sky site, I really want to make sure that I'm using my time as effectively as I possibly can. Um, so anyways, enough about my photos. What can we all, like, what would I recommend uh, for anyone who's getting started in the journey like I've recently gone through is set a budget. Um, sometimes you don't know how much your rate's going to end up costing you, but you know how much is in your bank account. And I really strongly recommend looking at what your budget is and then seeing realistically with your budget, what can you go for? Um, especially with a group like Novak, we have some amazing imagers in our group and you go out to these star parties and you'll see, you know, rates that cost $10,000, but you don't need to spend $10,000 to get good data. You can do it with a DSLR you may already own a $400 star tracker. Um, Light pollution is an obstacle, but it's not a showstopper. Again, I image a lot off my back porch in the Mortal 7. I know some people here image, you know, in their backyard in Mortal 9, closer to DC. Um, and all I'd like to say is, you know, if you're that close to DC, you probably have some more challenges than I do out in Mortal 7. But, you know, don't be afraid to try to tackle light pollution, especially in the post-processing side. It's possible. It is a bit of a pain, uh, but you know, don't look up at the sky and say, "Oh, I don't see anything." You can just give up because you know uh, you can get good results. Um, and then, probably my biggest thing that I've learned from all of this is sort of what I've taken into most of my photography uh, projects that I've done over the years, which is set reasonable expectations for every trip. You know, when I first got started building out, I really my bigger rate this year, one of the things I did was I bought one piece of equipment at a time. I brought it out to Sky Meadows State Park, I set it up on my back deck, and I slowly figured out, can I use it? Is it actually the equipment that I want? And what do I need if I have the ability to buy it? What will give me slightly better results over time? Um, and so just take your time, enjoy the process. Uh, a lot of people go out and they buy everything all at once and, you know, pray to the gods that everything works, you know, first time go around. And, you know, there, there really aren't any pre-made, already ready-to-go kits for astrophotography because there's just so many different types of it. You know, if you're trying to do planets or if you're trying to do galaxies or if you're like me trying to do wide field. Um, so, you know, take your time, build your rig out slowly and try not to make a mistake because as I think most of us here understand, uh, a lot of this gear isn't really cheap. So um, it, it definitely does suck when you buy a piece of gear and it ends up not working. And then uh, another thing too is 
you know, if you're a part of Novak, try to come out to some of our outreach events. I can't tell you how much wonderful advice I got from a lot of people. Some of them are even in this room tonight. I'm hoping that some of them are online as well. They gave me some excellent advice when I was setting up some of my bigger rigs. Uh, you know, hey, you know, I walk over to them and while they're in the gym and say, hey, here's what I have, here's where I'm trying to go. Does this make sense? And you know, some of them said, yeah, but hey, check out this thing, you know, maybe it'll help you out a little bit more. Or some of them said, uh, you're going in the complete wrong direction, in my opinion. And I would like to say that I listened to them all the time and that I had absolutely no regrets, uh, but I didn't. But every time I did listen to them, I had great results in the end. And you know, I'm eternally thankful because I get to one of the, I think the coolest topics out there, which is setting up a big rig under beautiful skies and taking images of the cosmos. Um, and then uh, one last thing, I always like to you know point out to folks too is, when you're taking these images, most of us are taking them for ourselves. So yes, if you go on Astro, then you're going to find images that are just astounding. You know, there's people out there who are always going to be better than you, no matter what you do. And I always take the opinion when I go out and do any photography of any sort is at the end of the day, all you really need to care about is, are you happy with your image? And as long as you're happy with it, for most of us, that's perfectly fine. Um, as far as I'm aware, no one here is working on the, you know, the web telescope and <laughs> any of that, but look at the policy. Is there? Uh, well, I don't think but, so. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, have fun with it. That's what a hobby is all about. And so uh, that's sort of my little spiel here. Um, hope I sort of yeah, covered what perfect. you wanted. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm still really new to all of this and you know, I'm loving every step of the journey. Um, you know, well, mostly loving. There's been a couple of nights where, you know, you go out with your new piece of equipment, you set it up and you think, oh, you know, I'll just run THD2. It's all going to work just fine. And, you know, you're pointing at stars and you're programmed to, if I can't find a star, it's like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Um, anyways, yeah, so. Questions. Nice job, uh, Mitch. Thank nice. you. <laughs> Question, John. One thing I found very helpful, which I did when I was starting out, after listening for years, because I was concerned about spending six hours, ten hours per picture, which you do at the high end. Get one of those camera adapters to your phone. Put it up to the eyepiece. You find something you like. Stick it on. Click, click, click. Seventy dollars. Yeah. Is all you're investing. You decide you don't like it, you waste seventy dollars, not three thousand. Yeah, I mean, if cell phone camera pictures are yeah. what you want to do. It's, it's a, a starting point. It's a great starting point. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, my main thing is like if you're trying, if you're a photographer and you already have a DSLR and you're like, yeah. I really want to go for something. I really want to, you know, try out the water. After the uh, the Sky Guider Pro is yeah. really, really afraid little rig that you know it's cheaper than most lenses that you're going to buy out there nowadays anyway so when um when you take the, the white field pictures from, from home you eliminate all the sky pollution light pollution in the processing no uh when it comes to uh my canon 5d mark ii um i'm not able to at this point my skills aren't good enough to remove all the light pollution but I'd say I can save about 75% of uh, the image most of the time. Uh, a couple slides back, uh, the shot of the Andromeda, uh, part of the data is actually from my house uh, in Mortal 7 uh, with an Optolong L Pro. And it's cropped in, I believe, about 50%. <clears throat> um, so if you have a full frame camera, especially, it can be really helpful because you have a lot more real estate that you can crop in on. Is your Pro filter in the camera or on the front of the lens? Uh, for the DSLR, it's in the camera itself. We have a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah someone online have a question? Base Federation. I'm reading out. They have their hand raised. Did you have any more? Yeah. 
maybe while they're thinking. Uh, so Mitch, on the uh, like, how much did you? Because you have this photography background before astrophotography, right? Yes. How much do you kind of credit that to giving you a real leg up on this that somebody else wouldn't have? Um, I mean, astrophotography is really <laughs> different from your standard photography. <laughs> It was a setback. It was a setback. <laughs> uh, the first few, I'd probably say the first dozen times uh, with extremely minimal training that I'm like, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing, overconfident myself. I took my, you know, I have a skyguider throw out with the DSLR. I got absolutely nothing. Um, got completely skunked or, you know, I didn't pay attention to the weather forecast and you know, it was too windy to effectively get any data. <laughs> Um, but it is a bit different, uh, you know, you're building your image over hours and hours and hours of data. Most of the time, uh, you know, you have to deal with light pollution, filter, or light pollution, you know, there's a whole lot of extra variables that, um, you know, I, I come from wildlife photography where you have two seconds to get your shot versus astrophotography, you know, as long as it's the right time of you have days and hours to get your shot. So it's it's a really it's a different mindset, but if you're up for a really fun challenge, it's a really fun challenge to have. Anyone else here in the room with a question? Um online maybe let's go online, see if anybody just just talk. You don't have to raise your hand. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hey cool. So I'm wondering uh what software and I'd be interested in in all three of the folks that are presenting tonight wondering what software they use for their image processing so currently i'm using uh serial to do my stacking prop my stacking and then i bring it into photoshop to uh stretch and you know finagle everything to make it look the way i want it to look what's your software i'm using uh, for stacking no for yeah for stacking. uh serial serial yes um, if you're new to the uh, astrophotography game, Cyril actually has automated scripts. So <clears throat> if you're like me, and my goal this year especially is just to get good data. If I get some great pictures out of it, even better. Um, but Cyril has automated scripts that are really easy to install. If you set your folder structure up correctly, it'll do a vast majority of the stacking work for you. Is it the best stacking work? No. But is it good enough to get you started? Yes. How is that spelled? How is that spelled? Oh, do you wanna you wanna type it in the chat box? S I R I L. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Anybody else online with a question for Mitch? Um, thank you, Mitch. Appreciate awesome. it. Yeah, good job. Which is the right one? Okay, um, so Chris Kagey, many of you know me. I've been up here before in a different, uh, you know, in a different um, uh, uh, role in the past. But uh, Paul asked me to give a little bit of rundown on, you know, my sort of mid-level intermediate, or I'm, I'm representing the intermediate tonight. Um, so a little bit, you know, a little background is just you can say, you know, I grew up in the 1970s. Uh, started you know, taking photography, doing photography in the 1970s. Um, growing up in the golden years of the space age, the you know, end of it, you know, got to see all the images coming back from the planetary probes and then Hubble and all that. And, you know, just um, loved it. And growing up in, in the rural part of the, the country where we could see the Milky Way, uh, you know, I got very used to that as well um so my hope initially when i got back into the hobby as an adult was to you know do some visual observing but living in uh arlington kind of thwarted that um and you know i pivoted to do photography uh you know like mitch leaning on my prior experiences but you know my my, my goal in this it was i wanted to be able to see the things that i couldn't see with my own eyes you know, and that translates into my regular photography as well. I do a lot of macro work. I do a lot of of uh, photographing things that people don't notice or can't see when they, you know, 
with cursory glances and so on and so forth. And I wanted to translate that into my astronomy as well. Um, one of the things that I that had was was uh, uh, something I took into consideration with all of this that I had come to know from photography is what you're going to do with your images makes a difference in what you need to create them or to, to take them. Um, if you are going to put things up on a big billboard or you know make huge prints of things, you need a different, you need to produce a different image than if you are looking at it on your cell phone or on a computer monitor. So you know, I factored some of that stuff into account as I was making some, some, of, my, some of my decisions as well. Uh, because I share my images online and I print them. In fact, I brought three things along here tonight over on the table there. That the folks in the room can take a look at uh, images that I made using the rig that I that, that I had here uh, with me. So you know, the major constraints or factors that influenced a lot of the decisions I made are really straightforward. You know, it's like I'm doing most of my my imaging from a driveway in Arlington. You know, and uh, yes, I could hop in the car and drive to a dark site, but the closest one is an hour away. And that means a two hour round trip that shaves time off of what I've got to actually take my pictures. Um, I wanted something that I could do reasonably locally, reasonably, reasonably quickly. Um, my sky is very bright. Uh, I know the North Star is there. I've taken pictures of it. I can't see it. Um, <laughs> You know, and uh, I honestly didn't know if I was going to enjoy this once I got going on it. So I didn't want to drop a lot of cash on things. I wanted to, you know, make a reasonable investment uh, that would give me results that I that I wanted. Um, have, you know, have a good chance of getting them, but uh, I didn't want to, you know, drop multiple paychecks on this if I could avoid it because. Like you say, you know, so I didn't want some cost on that. So, you know, give you a sense as to where I'm taking my pictures, where I'm imaging, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, it's suburban in the middle of my driveway. I've uh, got a, you know, real nice street lamp out here that kind of kills anything to the south. And I've got, you know, houses and trees all around me. I'm not as bad as Kevin Quinn, you know, with this little keyhole in the top of the sky. But, you know, I've got limitations um, for all of that. So, you know, taking time to think about some of these factors, and these, or I'm calling them constraints, that's the project management crap in me. Um, call it what you will, but taking time to think about them, let me draw some initial conclusions that influence a lot of the decisions that I'm making. So, you know, since I'm, you know, imaging at home, for me, that that uh, made me think probably better to have a smaller setup, something that's easier to carry in and out, something that I can store relatively compactly so I keep my family happy and I don't have a piece of you know a kinetic sculpture sitting in the living room half the time when I'm not out out uh, shooting. Um, you know, because I because I can't see many stars in the sky, naked eye. That suggested that I would, you know, want to use a camera and software to do polar alignment. Um, and also because of the, the nasty skies that I've got, it suggested that I probably have my best luck you know, doing narrow band imaging, rather so rather than um, taking pictures in the wavelengths of light that our eyes can see using a DSLR, like we're talking about. I'm using filters that I'm using a monochrome camera and filters that allow light to pass through that we cannot see with our eyes. So I have to map those into other uh, visual colors when I'm when I'm processing. Um, with the budget stuff, you know, so that was probably the hardest thing because it required patience. You know, could I be patient? And take advantage of the secondhand market to 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 get stuff. Um, by and large, I've been able to, um, but you know, it was a you know was a conclusion that I that I drew from this. And you know, that whole bit about a reasonable chance of getting images that would be pleasing. Um, 
Man, it's a big topic. And actually, Kevin Quinn has a, excuse me, has a great presentation on this that he's given the club before. But one of the things that he talks about is, um, you know, be like a wild animal, like a, you know, a, a, a gazelle or a deer or something, and follow the herd. Do what the you know, do what the herd is doing. If you're a trailblazer, you'll regret it. You'll either get eaten alive or you'll get lost. So you know, run with the herd. Do what others are doing. So for me, what that what that boiled down to, a lot of other people were doing was using a small, short refractor, get a pretty wide field image, and then software tools like Nina for automating the 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 running of the telescope and during the night, and then tools like Astropixel Processor and PixInsight for processing the images. Um, because there were other people doing this, it meant I had places I could go ask questions. Um, Novak was a big piece of that with the Brian Berger imaging for a lot of folks there. So in reality, what all of those things translated into after I had identified all those factors was you know a mount that could handle about 30 pounds and you could I aim for a second hand you know entry level or slightly larger mount um more importantly that meant things like some of these higher end mounts that I've listed here the CM70 paramounts or the astrophysics mounts were just out of the question out of our price range the weight was too much to be moving those things in and out up and down stairs um forget it. uh that would lead to frustration um for the cameras like i said if i'm doing narrow band imaging it means i need a mono a monochrome camera um when i was looking at this lots of people were using these two particular cameras the uh asi 1600 and the asi <laughs> three similar or similar cameras more importantly a next generation of things was on the way to the market, which meant people were, were dumping this, this prior generation cameras. Okay. Was I going to sacrifice anything? You know, if that, you know, looking at the images these people were producing and were thrilled to produce for the prior years, no, I was not going to sacrifice anything. And I went with a prior generation camera and built and wheels and equipment. So I ended up with a, you know, an 80 to a 1 or 2 millimeter refractor. Um, and in particular, I chose a refractor instead of something like a <coughs> Celestron Schmidt-Cassegrain or a Rasa or Rich Crescent, and so on and so forth. Uh, or a, that, that should say a reflector. Um, but, you know, all of those other telescopes, these things that I avoided, all have a much longer focal length and that meant were i to use one of those it would have made it harder to align harder to guide for an image you get a longer exposure it would have you know would have led to to complications that would have diminished the fun for me and my chances of success um i knew if i was doing narrow band i'd get long exposures three minutes or longer so that meant I had to track, the, the mount had to track and had to be guided to make sure the image was still centered, no problem there. And, um, you know, my hope was I'd be able to get out in the field once in a while. So I wanted everything to be able to be powered off of a 12 volt battery. So the computer run off 12 volt as well as the scope, the mount. I didn't want to mess with converters uh, or inverters to, you know, move voltage around and push stuff around um so anyway that was that that was an important consideration for me there so you know for the folks who are not in the room this is a picture of the rig that that i have here um it's not big uh it's you know the pieces as they break down they're all easy enough to handle and move around myself carry up and down stairs um in and out of the house Score well, uh, but you know, um, well, I'm going to pause pause on that. But uh, we'll come back to that in a second. So you know, here's what I've ended up using. Um, I began with 
a, a CG4 and an AVX. Um, the CG4 was a mistake. It was too old. Uh, you know, the thing worked, but uh, the electronics gave up the ghost very quickly on that because on a, because of age, honestly. Um, <laughs> I went to the AVX after that because uh, I, you know, drank the Celestron Kool-Aid. Um, <laughs> fine, fine mount. It worked great, but it was, you know, about this time I decided that I was going to enjoy this. So it it came with some limitations that I did that I knew I didn't want to deal with, and a club member uh, offered the mount I have here, this Ioptron Gem Forty Five on the club list sir so i grabbed it that gave me a path to grow um like mitchell i started using uh, my old dslr so those of you who are nikon people or d90 um they wrote about them in 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 the world book encyclopedia i think <laughs> uh, you know you can find information in print uh good luck online um but i started with that uh and uh quickly moved away from that because it was the one camera I had and I was watching my shutter count just go up through the roof every night. And I knew there was a limitation on a mechanical part like that. And it was likely to give up because. Um, so again, like at a similar time frame, I started to realize that I was going to enjoy this. And again, club members have offered for sale online of uh, both of the cameras and filters, both of them. So I took the opportunity to grab those and 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 uh, you know set myself up with what was a nice camera in its day, a dedicated astronomy camera, what was a nice camera in its day with good filters that still were good, but you know they're small by today's standards, uh, but they were perfectly fine with what I found. Um, you know, similar story with, with, with these other things. I, I was able to find used, uh, initially I used a uh, telescope uh, that I ran, again, was going to find I was enjoying this. I was having trouble getting good images with this because of just the design of the telescope. But I knew I wanted to do this. So the one piece of new stuff I have that I bought new was my telescope in the AT80 uh, with the focal reducer. Everything else was, you know, pretty straightforward, either cheap or free. Um, or if not, either of those, um, absolutely necessary that I couldn't do this without pattern. So uh, in the end, I met my goal of, you know, not, not dropping multiple paychecks. Uh, on this thing, I was able to control the costs, and you know, this is a kind of been explaining my my rationale behind some of these things. You know, um, there were there were deliberate choices that guided each decision that I made on this. Um, so, you know, for those of you who are in the room, you know, uh, it is not a large telescope. Um, online, eighty millimeters, roughly three inches. Um, it has about what, Mitchell, you said you're shooting with a 100 millimeter lens? Yeah. Okay, so this is just under 400 millimeters by the time the focal reducers on there. So uh, even with the small telescope, old generation camera and filters, I'm able to get, you know, the images, like I said, that I'm pleased with. You know, should I share them, you know, online? Absolutely great resolution for for online. You only need a hundred pixels per per inch for you know less than that for for a monitor. Um, you need about three hundred pixels per inch for a for print. Um, and if you know, you folks in here can see from the, uh, the the prints on the table. Again, I think it's a very adequate, good resolution for those things. Um, so you know. You don't need to get caught up in the arms race of gear <laughs> to be able to get, you know, very, very good, very satisfying um, images. 
Those um, crafts were also from Arlington. All, all those were from Arlington. Yeah. All those were from that, that spot of the driveway. So, you know, um, and even even this, so, you know, new, you know, new things that I'm, that I'm playing with. Dan, uh, the, the uh, pre-AHSP um, web uh, session on Star Trails with Mary, <laughs> that night, we had a clear night. I went out, I tried something from my, from my backyard, you know, damn it, it worked. You know, <laughs> and this is with that old DSLR. Um, you know, so all of a sudden, landscape photography, astro landscape photography, is now opened up to me as something I can explore. And we're, and I'm also interested in collaborating now with other astro photographers. Um, this image of the Tetpoles Nebula was a joint project um, with uh, Linda Thomas Fowler, Juan, who's going to speak next, um, Gallery. Uh, I will butcher her last name if I try, but you know, Gal with me and, and, and myself. And we we were shooting with four different telescopes, four different cameras, but we gathered about a hundred hours worth of data on the same target. And it was interesting. Now the challenge then was how do we combine all this information from these radically different uh, tools to see if we can get an image? And darn if it didn't work. You know, we, we, we each got, a, you know, we got four different images because we each processed it differently, we approached it differently, but dang, it worked it well enough that we're doing another project, another group collaboration that we've opened up to the club to see if we can go very deep on a very faint uh, supernova learner to see what we can find. Um, and uh, after all of this, you know, what kind of things have I learned? Well, this absolutely is a journey if you try to get there in one big step, you know, good one. Uh, you're going to be on that on that twisty road that Paul showed. Not uh, you know, you're not going to maximize your chances of a smooth way. Folks who are in software, if you're in agile software, don't boil the ocean. You know, take it a teacup at a time. Um, the other thing I found is focusing is really challenging. Um, in fact, Paul your recommendation one time we were talking and you you had just gotten your autofocuser and it opened up a new world for you well it didn't take long before i was going down that path too because middle of winter i didn't want to be out there with my fingers on cold metal trying to you know nudge the focuser forward and back um the advice kevin quinn gave it is it is wise to listen to those who have gone before um but at the same time, truly, you know, give thoughts to the limitations that you might face. Spend time trying to figure out, find out what those limitations are so you can knowingly face them instead of running into them like a brick wall. Um, other stuff here, some of it, yeah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Um, important things, even with these, the modest equipment I have, any limitations in the in the photos that that produced are my fault. Okay, my skills do not exceed the capabilities of the equipment I have for my location. So again, bigger is not always better. You know, getting caught up in the arms race is not always necessary. Um, the last thing I'll leave you with before I turn it over to Juan is that um, gathering your Gathering data, you heard Mitch talk about, you know, going out to gather data, okay, as taking pictures. Um, that's only half the story. Turning, turning that information into a finished picture is yet another journey that uh, is a whole different set of challenges. Okay, with that, Juan, I talked as fast as I could. I'm going to turn it over to you. We got yeah, theoretically about we, 15 months, but. i think we'll we'll probably go a little long which i think is good for the folks in the room hopefully for folks online sure. too um okay i want to make sure folks in the room here any questions for uh for chris yeah John. and what caused you to switch from astral pixel processor to pixel site um the the big factor there was more more people in novak use fix insight than APP, okay. and there were more people I could ask questions for, ask questions of for health. That's it. 
Again, I don't think it was limitations of the, of the software. Okay. I thought it might have been a limitation of the software. No, no. Uh, and I, you know, it, I'm I'm going to be generous to the guys who wrote the software. Mm -hmm. If there was something I couldn't do and couldn't figure out with APP, doesn't mean it can't do it. But I didn't have the resources locally to draw upon to get yeah. right that I did with this. Okay. Something like that. Something you can do for um, asset photography in like needed areas. A rifle gun sight, a laser pointer, an extended battery, and a old tripod you can put together a rig and not street lights out for hours. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> And I do a visual astronomy, and I'm sitting there trying to look at the central star on the Ring Nebula, and I couldn't get it. So I got up the tripod, knocked out the three street lights, and I observed for a half an hour. And tell them the Bepco truck is closed up. <laughs> and then you just tick them, and the light goes up, and the light stretches and drives away. And it's back on. Uh -huh. You can knock out those lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm nervous about about firing up lasers <laughs> in the uh, flight path of you know the airports. Yeah, it is yeah. Yeah. It, that's why you need your rifle sight. That's why you need rifle sight. Because the sensors are perpendicular to the road because they don't want a head the headlights. Right. So they're always facing towards the houses. So uh, always, uh, okay. So okay. you always get a good shot you can do that. <laughs> It's worth the effort. So okay. Very satisfying. <laughs> That's good. Uh, anyone else in the room or online? Yeah. Chris, can you yes. say something about how you do the photo online and you don't see the photo online? Sure. Um, the, the software I use, uh, Nina, has a polar alignment routine built into it. I, you know, I know roughly where North is, you know, and, and I can I can get close, you know, but then I run this polar alignment routine in Nina. It slews the telescope to three different positions, and then it tells me go you know go right two degrees, go up one degree, and it loops one second exposures. So I I can adjust it in real time to get it as close as I need to. I've also you know also learned you don't have to be. Uh, precise with polar alignment for this kind of stuff, wide field. You have to be accurate, but not precise. So um, I I use that to dial it in, tighten the bolts, and uh, push go. So yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, I can be polar aligned during twilight without easily being able to see lights. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone online? Cool. So All right. uh, what we'll do though at the, at the end of Juan's presentation, yeah. we'll take a look at in the room here, we'll look at Chris's photos and time permitting. If it's okay, we'll we'll gather around your equipment and ask questions again. Sounds good. All right, sweet. Thanks, uh, Chris. And uh Juan is online, hopefully. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Hey there. Right. Hey Juan. Do so you we'll want me to present the slides or how do you want me to do this? Yeah. Yeah, we'll flip for it. We'll flip for you. Uh, yeah. Okay, because right now I cannot see them. I was seeing them up uh, there. No, I, I, I understand what's going on. So, one, give me one. <clears throat> Sorry, Juan. Yeah, I'm going to try here. I don't know. Can you see them up? Yes, um, I'm gonna just ask you to, you know, go to the next slides uh, when I when I'm talking because I. Oh. Yeah, if you can go up to my name, my intro. Oh, okay. Next one. All right, so I, yeah, uh, yeah, the one before. Sorry. Here you go back one. Yeah. Okay, so I will try to be respectful of time, but I may go over a little bit because uh, there's a, a few slides that I, I would like to share. Um, I'll be quick on this one uh, just for some context because uh, I think context is important on our journeys, right? Um, I, why astrophotography? I'm a software engineer. 
Um, that's what I do as a profession. And I've also been taking pictures since I was about 15 years old. So astrophotography is a good intersection of those two kind of uh, ways of approaching things, right? Uh, it's a mix of technical stuff and artistic stuff. So um, it was kind of natural to, to go there. Uh, I started a long time ago, actually, um, very early in my, in my um, I guess, uh, life, if you will. Uh, as a late teenager, I was trying to take pictures of the night sky with, uh, with film. Uh, failed miserably for a long time and then got some results. And um, yeah, that was interesting, but I didn't get too far with it. Um, when the digital imaging revolution uh, happened with CCDs, I was, uh, I was completely sold on that. I wanted to do that. This is what I wanted to do with uh, astronomy and, and photography. It really spoke to me. So I, I was able to buy my first uh, CCD around 2001. Back then, it was a kit that you had to put together. Uh, I actually bought it secondhand, so I didn't have to put it together myself. But it was a very old technology with about 200,000 pixels or something like that. Um, my first few years uh, during this journey were really tough. Um, I actually had very little help or none at all because I was one of the few people doing it. The other thing that I wanted to say that I was young, I was in my early 20s, and it felt very intimidating to go to people and ask them for help. So I know that we don't get a lot of young younger folks, but if there are some out there, don't don't feel shy about asking for help because uh, it's gonna it's gonna make all the difference. Um, the, this first few years, things like polar alignment, uh, finding and centering your target, <clears throat> or focusing were extremely challenging. Uh, I actually have lost the entire nights uh, to these processes. And some people might be thinking, how is that possible? But yeah, we didn't have plate solving. Or I remember when PhD2 came out, uh, right? I mean, this these tools have um, uh, evolved a lot. Uh, the technology has come a long way. And it's a lot easier uh, these days. Um, I think also the, the standards evolved, right? So you can get farther with what you can do. Uh, but it's a good time to to get into this hobby because uh, there's a lot of materials, a lot of possibilities, um, and a lot of people that have gone through this. I um, I bought my first uh, my PixInsight license in 2008. That gives you an idea of how long I've been doing this. And I joined Novak in 2009. But I've been out, in and out of the hobby uh, for a few years. You know, live, family, um, having kids, other hobbies. Uh, got in the way, but I kind of came back really strongly uh, about late 2017. And as many of you all uh, with the pandemic, a lot of time at home, uh, yeah, I spent uh, the last few years uh, taking pictures pretty much every clear night. So if you can go to the next one. What are my interests? Um, initially, I was fascinated by galaxies. This is what I wanted to do. I want to image uh, distant galaxies. But I had a problem. I was born and raised in Madrid, Spain, which means extremely high light pollution. And then I moved to Washington, D.C. back in 2008, which means also extremely high light pollution. So light pollution is really bad for broadband targets. Uh, and galaxies fall within this um, category, right? You have to image them, for the most part, uh, without filters or you know, with minimal fil filters. Um, so for the first few years for me, doing this required going out to the field, but this is pretty unsustainable for me. Um, you know, work, um, family, other hobbies, uh, just family, life gets in the way, right? And, uh, at the end of the day, I started counting how many times I would go out to the field and it was maybe six, eight times per year, maybe 10, um, the best year that, that wasn't uh, a way to advance in the hobby. So, um, for me, the equipment considerations and all that all the things that i do these days are very geared towards maximizing the the amount of time that i can put into this without getting without going crazy right um so one of the things that happened through that process is that my my area of interest uh, broadened and uh, i am imaging any pretty much any deep sky object that i can find these days um that includes galaxies of course but also I've uh, grown uh, a lot into emis emission nebulae with nearby filters, as I'll show in a few minutes, uh, supernova remnants, uh, et cetera. 
And for me, the, the real revolution has been to be able to image from home. Um, and that's been the biggest boost to my to my uh, growth, uh, you know, into this hobby because I can do it many more times, and that means that I get to practice more. Uh, astrophotography, like any other, uh, I guess, activity, the more you do it, the better you get at it, right? So, uh, having said that, the I believe that the single most important contributor to image quality is a dark sky. So hold that thought because I'll get back to that in a in a few minutes. Uh, next slide. So these are my first, well, some of my first uh, digital pictures. And, um, you know, they're not anything to write home about. Uh, I'm kind of, I, I, I like seeing them because it shows where I started. Um, as you can see, a lot of galaxies, uh, they're very small. If you look closer, the stars are not round. Uh, these, none of these are guided. Um, and I have started the wrong way. I Since I wanted to image galaxies, I bought an eight inch uh, telescope. Uh, with a focal length of, of about 1,400 millimeters. And I put a CCD camera on the back of it. And that's what I thought I had to do. But that is a very challenging way to learn. So again, focusing, auto-guiding. Uh, these are like my successes. But I had a lot of failures along the way as well. Uh, next slide. With time, you do get better. Um, you know, fast forward a few years. The, the image on the left is 2009 from uh, AHSP. Uh, that was taken with a short refractor. Um, and I did okay. You know, it's M33. I could, you know, I could see the galaxy. And the one on the right, um, you know, about 10 years later uh, is much better, right? Same object. Um, it's actually taken, this, this is kind of a, a funny anecdote. The image on the right is taken with the same initial telescope that I bought 20 years late, uh, earlier, right? So. I was finally able to to squeeze uh, what that instrument could could give, even though now it's so old and it's falling apart. But um, I took a long uh, deviation, and um, I do not advise people to get a large telescope to do astrophotography at the beginning. It's going to lead into a lot of frustration. Uh, next slide. So welcome to my dark sky. Uh, this is. Um, this is Bortle. I, I, you know, make a joke and call it Bortle 9000. Um, this is where I image from most of the time. This is uh, the view from my house. Um, as you can tell, it's pretty horrible. Um, I've gotten the neighbor to turn that white, uh, bluish, uh, bright light off sometimes, but sometimes he forgets, and I don't want to, you know, wake people up in the middle of the night. So sometimes I get lucky, and that. Uh, bright light is not on but it doesn't matter the the street lamp that you can see on the uh, upper left on the top picture is always on i can neither confirm nor deny that the laser turns it off it's a lot of fun but it could also get me into a lot of trouble so i let's not go there but yeah uh, i have to live with that light uh for better or worse and the picture at the bottom is my scope um in the middle of the night this is one of my my security cameras. Uh, that is midnight. Can you see any stars? <laughs> yeah. So that's that's those are my constraints, right? Um, that means that I have to I have to make the best of of what I have uh, because again, imaging from home means I can do it on a weekday, even if I have to work the next day, and I get to do more of it. So um, next slide. Some equipment considerations uh, based on this is I I wanted to get the highest quality that I can afford, uh, of course, within reason. For me, that means uh, not going into debt. But, you know, I've been accumulating gear for years. And um, I guess uh, when you see all the stuff that I have, uh, maybe it's maybe it's excessive. But this is a this is a range. There's way more excessive people uh, when you get into this uh, more seriously. Right. So, I mean, everyone has their threshold i wanted to get the the best quality equipment that i that i could get i want to maximize data acquisition and for me what that's entailed the last uh, year year and a half is that i wanted to run two rigs at the same time or at least have the option to do that um that maximizes you know the mid atlantic is not a great place to do this right we have a lot of uh, clouds and rain and 
and sometimes when it's clear the conditions are not that good e either so whenever i have a chance i want to maximize the the data collection and my rigs are designed for full automation uh, this is something that also plays into the the equipment choices because um not everyone needs this but um my my mid, mid to long term goal is to actually have a remote um, observatory somewhere. I'm still working on what that's going to look like. I have no idea, but hopefully next year I can start uh, thinking about that. And um, for that, I wanted to start getting ready for you know being able to to do that. And then the other aspect is, uh, as I was uh, thinking about adding a second telescope, a third telescope, etc., is uh, specialization. Uh, there's different objects out there. There's this, different types of uh, deep sky astro astrophotography, and no single telescope is going to do all of them really, really well. Um, so, you know, I've, in my mind, I classified the uh, the different types of objects, like I mentioned here, with uh, you know ultra wide field, something like a camera with a tracker, like Mitch was talking about. I actually don't have a tracker right now, so this. This part is kind of missing from from my collection. Um, the next step would be like what I call super wide field, about around 300 millimeters of focal length. Uh, wide field is where most people image around four to 600 millimeters of focal length. This is a great place to be, and you can spend your life imaging at these focal lengths. Uh, you you will not get tired of collecting data in this kind of range. And then the longer stuff, right? You want to get more detail. You want to be more. Uh, you want to get to those galaxies, uh, etc. Um, about nine to a thousand millimeter focal length is where you want to be, and the reason I said is because something to consider if you're getting started in, into this is that the newer cameras have um, CMOS sensors and they have very tiny pixels, so it's very important to match the the size of those pixels with your focal length. And there's some formulas that you can take a look at online. Um, and most of the time, if you go over a thousand millimeters, you're just not getting any more detail. Because yeah, the sky becomes your limit. The, the seeing becomes your limit. So that is considered these days long focal length for the most part. Um, and um, it's a good place to be when you want to be you know, taking pictures with, with detail. Um, next slide. So with all that in mind, and I, I understand this presentation is uh, equipment uh, heavy and focused, but <clears throat> The one thing that I will say about astrophotography is that the most important piece of equipment is the mount. This is counterintuitive. People think that it's the optics or having a really good camera, or th those are all secondary. Uh, the, the mount is uh, the, the foundation. You have to have a, a, a good, stable mount that can track the sky accurately. And the good thing is that these days, there are so many options in all price ranges to do this from the, from the star tracker. All the way up to you know fully robotic mounts that cost an insane amount of money. Um, I chose to, and this is uh, you know in the last uh, three years or so, I focused on having one premium mount as as my main um, uh, mount, which is the one on the left. It's a software based Paramount. Uh, this is a you know remote ready mount. This robotic mount. Uh, you can you can only actually use it with software, so it requires. A computer to to use, uh, which is fine by me because again I'm focusing on imaging, and then a medium tier um, option as a secondary so that I can run uh, two rigs. That's the Ioptron CM70, and I chose that one because both of these can actually uh, run payloads of about 50 pounds uh, for imaging um, easy, right? Or at least you know they, they have that that capability. I'm not getting up to that limit, although my bigger scope is close to that or getting closer to that. Um, but I wanted both both months to be able to do that so that if one breaks, I have a backup and that sort of thing. Uh, next slide. So for telescopes, um, and if you remember what I mentioned um, in the different uh, types of uh, wide field DSO imaging, um, I, I have chosen uh, the, the one in the middle, the picture in the middle is, I guess, the, the main takeaway here, because those are two, my two main imaging rigs. Those are the ones that I use the most. Um, the one on the front is uh, sitting on top of the Ioptron. It's a Skywatcher Spree 100. This is a four-inch refractor, uh, F5.5, uh, so it's pretty fast. 
and uh, that's been my workhorse. Uh, I I run it with a um, with a monochrome uh, camera, and this is the the equipment that I know the best. I've had it for a few years now, and I've taken a, a bunch of images with it. The one on the back is kind of my dream setup, but I only purchased this one um, earlier uh, last year. I think uh, earlier this year is when I received it. Um, it's a Stellar View SVX 140, so it's a larger uh, five and a half inch uh, refractor, uh, premium optics. This is one of the the main premium refractor vendors. Uh, this is for me a lifetime telescope, right? This is the thing that I will pass on to my children and then <coughs> sell it or something. I don't know, but it's a uh, it's something to, that will last uh, as as long as I can as I am able to take care of it. Um, and I'm still. I've taken a few images with it. I'm super happy with it, uh, but still optimizing that that setup um, as I go. The one on the left is kind of my super wide field um, setup. I'm I'm not using this one right now because um, I can only have like three telescopes set up for imaging. I don't have all the electronics, you know, four times. And um, but that one is a 400 millimeter um, telescope with a 0.7 reducer, so it goes down to 280 millimeters, uh, and that's an ASCAR uh, FRA 400. And very recently, uh, this summer, this past summer, I acquired um, the telescope on the right. It's a Takahashi Epsilon 130. Um, this is a reflector, and it's a really fast f 3.3. If you remember what I said earlier, that the uh, the biggest contributor to image quality is a dark sky. So yes, I image from home. I maximize my data acquisition that way, but I want to go back to the field. I enjoy being out there with a pair of binoculars, looking at the sky and having my telescope, um, you know, sucking up photons. And um, the reasoning behind this uh, particular telescope is that it's very fast. So I'm hoping that I can get images in one night, right? I go out there, I image for five to eight hours, something like that. And then I come back and I have something that I can process and I can just uh, you know um, be done with it. Uh, that's kind of the the idea. So next slide. I'm just uh, putting here some samples taken with this equipment. This is with the uh, four inch refractor. I took this last summer. It's about twenty hours total time. Uh, this is a narrowband filter, so false color, uh, taken through um, sulfur, hydrogen, and, and oxygen filters. Uh, and this is taken from that horrible location that I, that I showed you earlier. So from Washington, D.C., the middle of Washington, D.C. Uh, next one. <clears throat> this is the uh, an example with the super wide field uh, refractor, the little one. So this is a four panel mosaic. This took me actually uh, three months to complete, you know, because uh, you have four panels and you have uh, three filters per panel and you, you've got to capture a lot of data. And uh, for this one, uh, it ended up being about 60 hours total integration time. Um, really long-term project. Uh, I do like doing mosaics. And um, I'm actually looking forward to starting a new one soon. Uh, but this required 19 uh, nights of imaging. So it's pretty involved uh, type of project. Also taken from uh, Washington, D.C. Um, the filters were not as good as the previous one, but they still work. So that's another. Uh, good thing to know about. Um, next one. This is one of the, my most recent images, uh, the Tulip Nebula. This is taken with the big refractor, uh, about 17 hours total, also uh, narrowband, uh, also from Washington, D.C. Uh, next one. And I wanted to put a, an example of my my initial calling, right? The, the galaxies. Um, get, broadband is super hard to do from a very light polluted uh, location it can still be done so and i'm playing with this idea uh, for this one what i wanted to do is there's a happy coincidence between uh, with my equipment that the uh, the field of view of both the big telescope and the smaller telescope is closely the same because the camera chips are are different in size so they they end up working to be about the same field of view and what I did for this one is uh, put both telescopes to work on the same target. So I took the luminance with the big refractor, and I got the color with the the, the four inch refractor. Um, and uh, in about four nights, I was able to capture 34 hours of total integration time. 
again from Washington DC. And this is not a, an image that will win any contest, but at least I, I can get my my edge uh, scratched, so to speak, and um, I can still do it. Uh, but yeah, it's not an ideal situation because uh, I will say about this image, um, 34 hours of acquisition time, I think I probably spent that much processing it. I processed this like three or four times until I was happy with it. It's, it's really it's really challenging. And I think uh, next slide, uh, the final one that I have, this is my most recent completed image. This is from uh, AHSP a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and this is the Takahashi uh, telescope that I, that I mentioned. So what's nice about going to a dark sky is that you can image things that are basically impossible to do from, from a location like mine at home. Uh, this is a dark nebula. These things are super faint. And um, I used a one-shot color camera, which are a little less sensitive, but with only six and a half hours from a Bordeaux 2, I was able to get uh, a fair result, I think. And I, I want to do more of this in the um, uh, you know uh, nights that we have together when we do bullet nights or or just regular imaging at the uh, locations that we have. Uh, about an hour from from my location is a big improvement already. Um, and then next slide. So my key takeaways. Just to wanted wanted to keep this short and focused on a, a few ideas because the the topic is huge, right? But Number one, the mount is the most important part of your equipment. You really want your mount to get out of the way, and you want to learn how to use it as good uh, as possible so that you know when you tackle a new project or go out in the field and start imaging, it, it, wor it works. Uh, it's very frustrating to have mount issues. And I think we all do to some extent still because these are mechanical uh, devices and there's software involved, but... Um, if you have a budget, think about spending most of that on the map. Uh, I would master one skill and go into the next one. I was trying to learn how to do autofocusing and, and also auto guiding and all at the same time. That's that's just, it's going to waste your night. So, you know, if you don't know how to auto guide, maybe take very short exposures. You still get a, a nice image out of it and learn how to focus first and then you know build on top of that build on top of your successes um software trumps hardware at the end of the day i would say that 60 to 70 percent of your result is going to be your post processing a lot of people don't like to hear this but it is true you have to you have to have good data or, or decent enough data so that the result is 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 uh, still good but then with, with very good data, the, the difference between your image and someone else's is going to be what you can do with it uh, in, the, in the software tools, right? Um, okay. I use uh, PixInsight. I did mention it. I, I, I've been using it for many years. I also use Photoshop, although increasingly I don't because I don't, I don't feel like I have a need for it uh, for, my, for what I want to do with my images. But um, <laughs> I don't think there's a, there's a single um, you know, answer to this. Use whatever feels comfortable. Um, and um, the point is that it's a journey, not a destination. So, I mean, this is a hobby. You just have fun with it. And I think that's all I had for you guys. I'm hoping that I didn't go too too long with the time, but I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Thanks. Thanks, Juan. That was great. Um, yeah, so let's start online. Let's see if anybody has a question on, on, on online. <laughs> Ron, Juan, we'll, we'll go to the, well, I guess we'll go to the end room then, but uh, I, where's your remote going to be? Is it going to be local or actually out in Spain somewhere? I'm actually looking to put it out in Spain. Okay. I, through one of those um, very interesting uh, coincidences in life, I actually met someone uh, through family that is uh, building a business for remote hosting. So um i trust those guys they're not operational yet but at the end of the day i think it's going to cost me half of what I, it would cost me to put it here and it doesn't matter to me to put it in new mexico or california or southern spain i still have to take a plane if i want to see my telescope right so yeah uh that's the the idea for now but we'll see still like a, a very much a, um, a a work in progress any questions in the room for 
for one. I have one. Yeah. See, it looked like several of your uh, scope setups were on an Ioptron tripod uh, mount or, or tripod uh, or pier, I guess. Uh, yeah. Do you have multiple versions or, or was that the same one? It was the same one. Yeah. Does it work for you? Yep. I I bought the uh, Ioptron about a year ago, a year, but maybe a little more. A little more. And um, I haven't had any issues with it. It's uh, it's been pretty rock solid to the point where some nights, and this is an interesting uh, game that I play. Uh, you know, I like to I control my telescopes from inside the house, and I can see what they're doing and all that. So I have two, you know two screens, um, and sometimes I I watch what what PhD is doing with both mounts, and some nights they're doing exactly the same, exactly the same, um, you know accuracy with with guiding uh some days the paramount is better because it is a better mount but i would say that for the for the type of imaging that we usually do um with the skies that we have uh you have to remember most of us live very close to sea level so we have to go through all that atmosphere to to get our our photons um you don't need a super precise mount it is nice to have but you can get really good results with uh, um, much lower priced uh, options. Now, if you ask me about remote, that's a different um, answer probably because, yeah, sometimes I have to go out and take a look at the eye up to make sure that, you know, it's not doing anything funny or uh, I don't trust it as much to run completely unattended, but it's still possible. So. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. Juan, how, uh, can you see Polaris, or how do you pull her line? And how big of a deal is that to get right um, before yeah. you start? So I can see Polaris um, because um, one thing that I, that's good about my location uh, is that I the the view that I showed on those pictures is um, the southern part of my of my uh, sky. And I usually image east to west. So I, I usually go 40 degrees from the east to the west and um, a little bit to the north. But the northern part of the sky is, is not as bad. And uh, I can see polaris. Sometimes the house gets in the way, depending on where I put my rigs. I use software to polar line. I think um, these days um, the tools are really good. And I also use Nina with the iOptron, like uh, Chris does. It takes five minutes to do. I do it before I can actually image. Uh, and for the um, for the Paramount, they have their own routine. Uh, that one's really precise, and I do that because sometimes the Paramount allows you to uh, image unguided. So if you build a um, a sky model, which also takes a few minutes, uh, you can actually run unguided. And for for the LRGB stuff, I don't guide the Paramount. I just run two minute exposures and the the stars come out round. That that is what you pay for with those months, right? In a way, um, and that you know that that's not again that's not necessary. But what you get in you get by doing that is a bit more a bit more time imaging because you don't have to do the the usual uh, auto guiding look for star, lock the star, start guiding, stop guiding the you know the dithering. All of those things are. Are not there, and um, for narrow for broadband, which is very short exposures, um, and many of them, right? Um, you want to minimize the amount of time that it takes to to do those things. So for for that, when I use the Paramount, I don't guide, but um, for polar lining, I use I use um, software in both cases. All right, thanks, Juan. Any more questions from either here in the room or online? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, do you do you set up your equipment every time, or do you have it all set up and somehow wheel it out on a cot? I I set it up every time. Um, two rigs is uh, six trips to the garage, uh, and um, you know that that gets old sometimes. Um, what I try to do is, like this week, fingers crossed. I think we're going to have several nights in a row that are going to be clear. So I leave them outside. I have a, uh, a a cover where I can just cover them with a telegismos cover, 
and um, they stay outside for a few days. Okay. Uh, that way, the second night, the second and subsequent nights are really, really nice because it's having like it's like having an observatory. You pull the cover off, turn things on, click a button, and I can go to sleep basically. Okay. Yeah, my, my problem is I set up every time because I, I tend to travel somewhere out west to image and I'm toying with the idea of maybe trying to figure out some kind of wiring loom where I tie together all my cables and I pull them off as one and, and reconnect them as one. But uh, yeah, I, I have that in my rigs. Um, so cable management is a, is a time saver because especially with the one that I used to go to the field, uh, the Takahashi that I put together this summer, that one is a, a unit, right? I have the, the reflector and the, the PC, the um, all the electronics are on top of it. And I only have one cable that goes to the mount, and that's what gives it power. And okay. it powers everything. It powers the the um, the guider camera, the main camera, the PC, even a little uh, travel router that I used to connect remotely to, to the PC from the laptop. So everything is like a one unit. I just put it on the mount, connect one cable, uh, you know, connect the battery to the mount, and I'm ready to go. And that saves you a lot of time, especially when you're turning down, which is the the worst part. You know. Yeah, because you're half asleep and it's four a.m. and. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Appreciate the talk. All three of them were terrific. Uh, and we'll just wrap it up here. Uh, I've just had a couple slides. I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, there we go. Um, okay, quick summary, you know, something to kind of close it out here. Um, start with manageable goals. I think all three of them kind of hit on that. Some things are more important than the other things. Uh, they're not all equal. Uh, one certainly emphasized the mounting, super critical. Uh, but start with manageable goals and then kind of branch out from there. Um, I think the big takeaway for us as club members is make use of what you have available. We have terrific people in the club with deep knowledge on all these different things. Take, take advantage of that. You've got a great loaner scope. You can try different things, piece together rigs for yourself, see how they work. Uh, no cost. Good way to get started. Use the listserv, our email uh, service for ideas and for help. And of course, there's, we have a special interest group totally focused on imaging. And uh, you can certainly join into that and get terrific advice. So. Um, keep trying. Yes, patience is required. Um, I think it's okay to be on this road, actually. I think that's how you learn, and it's okay to circle back. I have a whole drawer full of stuff that is unused right now. It's my little, uh, you know, the island of misfit toy. <laughs> that. I have one of those. So make mistakes. It's okay. Uh, I think frustrations do lead to improvement over time. And you can get better at it. Um, and as Juan said, uh, have fun, enjoy the journey. So we're going to end it here for the folks online. Um, help us at Stargate if you can. That's coming up real soon. We'll see you out at uh, Udbar Hazi. That's also coming up, 1st of October. Uh, jump into that lunar challenge. I think that'll be a lot of fun for, for a lot of us. Uh, I may try that myself. So there's a lot of cool things coming up. We're going to do a little show and tell here. Um, and if there are no other questions, we'll we'll drop off from, from online. And uh, yeah, we'll see you out in the fields. So we're, thanks. thanks we're in person so we can thank the uh, speakers, which we haven't done for two and a half years. Yeah, thank you, Juan. Actually, I do have one more slide that I forgot. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, thanks, thank to you guys, Mitch, uh, Chris, and Juan. Terrific job. And, uh, not too bad for piecing it together on the amateur level, right? So appreciate it. Uh, so we'll drop off online, and then uh, we can we can head over and take a look at some equipment and some pictures on the back table. So 